Hello and thanks for listening. Today I have the privilege of being joined by Stephen Kerr. Stephen has an impressive pedigree and can boast many professional accomplishments. Stephen hails from the Kerr family, a Melbourne dynasty whose influence extends to the city's biggest businesses and charities and whose name is synonymous with public relations and journalism. Stephen is the son of the late Laurie Kerr, who founded International Public Relations, which was Australia's quintessential PR company for more than a quarter of a century. Stephen gained his professional start in the family business under the tutelage of esteemed media and communications professionals. He has since become a PR veteran in his own right, having enjoyed a 25-year career with many years spent at an elite level. For many years, Stephen was the Managing Director of Australian Operations for the global PR giant, Weber Shandwick. He now manages his own public relations firm, Public Relations Exchange, which provides senior counsel and communications expertise to a range of Australia's largest and best-known companies, as well as government departments and not-for-profits. Um, Stephen, can you provide some background on your education and career? including professional highlights for me? Uh, yes, I started uh, in the public relations profession at the age of 18, um, having had a uh, failed year at Monash University doing economics okay. uh, in, subject, in subjects I wasn't uh, familiar with, being statistics and accounting. Uh, so at the age, I was young for my HSC year, I then went and started work at uh, my late father's business, International Public Relations, at the age of 18, yep. uh, and worked happily away and, and then started uh, an arts degree at Swinburne when I was 26 and studied at night and finished it when I was 30. So you work, worked and studied concurrently? Yeah, and had a family, so it was all oh. interesting times, but it worked well for me. Yeah, okay. Um, I wanted to, because obviously your family is quite, quite legendary in the industry, and your father, the late Laurie Kerr, started International Public Relations. Um, of reading up on, on Laurie, um, the age described him, basically said that IPR for more than a quarter of a century was flackery in Australia with fingers in pies from politics to confectionery, that IPR managed crises and made issues disappear, made millions of dollars, and I guess was essentially the, the quintessential PR firm for a, a very long time. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about your father's your father's reach and his legacy. Sure. Look, I, I think in a lot of ways he he and uh, uh, people like Eric White um, were really the founders of the modern public relations industry. As much as um, uh, modern is an interesting word, but certainly in the in the context that we know it. Um, yeah. Uh, Laurie started off as a, a, a journalist and uh, a master of art, which was not uh, common in the 50s. Uh, he played football and was a professional foot runner. So he, he, he was a driven man. Um, and uh, he had a, a knack and ability to, I think, through those sporting connections and other connections, really develop a fabulous network. And uh, I think at his peak, um, you know, th those comments are probably true as much as he was a modest man. He, uh, terms like flackery and others descriptors uh, that wouldn't sit well with him, okay. but he was just a, a really uh, uh, effective operator who employed brilliant people, um, and uh, that that was something he always was keen to uh, acknowledge that the people around him um, were as important as he was, uh, and probably it's true, you know, that they really worked on some of the major issues that this country faced sort of in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, yeah. uh, and uh, were, were, I think, justifiably the, considered the most effective and uh, public relations consultancy in the country. Mm, okay, that, that leads me to my next question, and I was going to ask you, um, obviously a lot of the nation's leading PR firms today were founded by or are run by former IPR staff and I wanted to know what is it that you think about that what is it about IPR that was such a fertile training ground for all these um, sort of people who are industry leaders today? Oh look I think it was a mix of the, of the clients and the opportunities that that gave good people to work on uh, but it was also the collaboration and the mentoring that went on there I mean in my own circumstance if I can give an example one um, I remember watching the television news one night and uh, on the Channel 9 news they said that 
the editor of the Herald Sun, John Fitz, uh, sorry, the Herald Time, John Fitzgerald, was joining IPR. Yep. Well, he became managing director of our Victorian office, and lo and behold, he, he was my mentor for about a decade. Oh, okay. Um, and, uh, you know, the, John, uh, he was a brilliant man, um, a great communicator, a great writer, and just a, a terrific man to work with. But, you know, that was the sort of environment that um, all of us were, were able to benefit from. And, of course, John left IPR, but he, he then went on to work with John Bertrand in, in, in the America's Cup defences and the Olympic movement and other things. But uh, that was a calibre of people that were drawn to IPR, and yeah. that was the opportunity, I think, that um, younger people uh, were able to benefit from. Um, so I'm sure that uh, when IPR eventually uh, was acquired by Shamwick and then successive owners, uh, people moved on. Uh, but, yeah, you're right, they're dotted all around the country in terms of communications roles. A number of the, the, the PR guys I've spoken to have said, I've sort of suggested that a lot of PR companies sort of come and go and can't expect um, longevity in this sort of climate. And I'm wondering what do you attribute the success and longevity of your firm to? Uh, look, I, I hope I did learn something from my father, and that was really the value client relationships. And I, and I think that um, I, I'm looking at our client wall now as I'm, we're, we're talking and, and there are clients on that wall that were with us on day one of starting um, PRX, so in 2001. So um, I think that, you know, the attributes that I, I consider as fundamental to being an effective operator these days is to be the client relationship and really become... Um, if, if friendship's part of it, that's great, but it, but more importantly, it's becoming a key strategic advisor to your clients. Yep. Um, and that's, that's beyond, you know, the normally normal marketing or communications channels. That, that's being able to deal with a board or a CEO or a chairman or an owner or a founder and dealing with the big issues that really um, uh, are important to them. Yep. And uh, that's something that PRX has done very well. I think um, I think that echoes something Chris Savage said, which was that PR is a, a relationships business. a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. And, and and that goes to another point, Susie, that we don't tender for work. Um, never have, never will. Um, we're totally reliant on our network and our relationships to regenerate and create new opportunities. So uh, that that's probably a, a key reflection of that. Yeah, I would, I'd imagine that's quite unusual. I don't know. Uh, well, it is, and. Yeah. and um, uh, uh, you know, I've been careful to position PRX as a, um, you know, a high-level strategic communications firm. I, I don't want to compete in the commodity space of PR because, frankly, it's um, too hard to win work. And secondly, uh, uh, perhaps the, the, the client opportunities aren't as lucrative or, or as um, engaging as they could be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, I'm sort of jumping around questions here, but that brings me to something else I wanted to ask you. Um, some of the people I've spoken with have said that they think one of the secrets to success in PR is to specialise, um, and whether that's specialising in, in terms of a particular area, such as health or a medium such as online or a demographic or whatever, um, it sounds like you're sort of suggesting that, that that's um, a philosophy you would agree with. Is that fair to say? Uh, I'll give you a... Uh, uh, Cautious response, yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, uh, I know and I've experienced the big global firms uh, trying to be as general as they can, but also specialising in the practice groups. Mm -hmm. So as you suggest, health, you know, digital, uh, consumer, uh, the like. Um, uh, I have a slightly different view that... Um, PR, PRX isn't a global provider. You know, we're, we're 10 full-time and four or five part-time. Um, but I, I would suggest to you the specialisation is in the in the practice of uh, and the skills and the disciplines. And, and I'm more of a view that you can lend those skills um, and disciplines to a whole range of industries. Okay, yeah. So um, I, I know I'm sitting on the fence a little bit, but... Yeah, I, I, I get specialisation, but, you know, specialisation in, in practice groups opens you up to conflicts. Oh, okay, um, can yes. You do two, can, you do, can you do two banks? 
Yeah, okay. Uh, can you do two insurance companies? No. I noticed um, actually so, on your website that, that you specifically say that, that you don't have conflicts of interest. or I can't remember the wording, but you... you well, look, it's fundamental to that, that relationship piece I was talking about before. I mean, if, if, you, if you've had a 20-year relationship with a CEO of a major business, you can't start working for his competitor, can you? Yeah, okay. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, look, it's a pragmatic answer, I think, um, but... Um, uh, I, I see the specialisation more around the skills, mm-hmm. and you can impart those skills in other in in different e- industries. Um, you know, it's a, uh, and going to that point, I mean, um, anyone who you, who's under the age of probably thirty five, uh, uh, more digitally capable, if you like, or conversant than older people like me. Yep. Um, whereas, you know, I, I can bring to a, a client what a a, a, a different view that traditional media is probably as important as, as digital media, although that that might change over the over the you know the next uh, decade. But you know, so there's a there's a place and context for all of it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, shifting gears, I was, I noticed on your website I was quite heartened to see that you guys actively promote internships and work experience to suitable applicants. Um, obviously, from a, a somebody the perspective of somebody who's about to graduate, that's really fantastic. But I'm wondering, from from your perspective, what are the broader benefits in helping to educate that next sort of uh, crop of PR graduates? Uh, look, I, I take a view you, you've got to um, contribute to the industry, but but being uh, pragmatic again, it's the best source of recruitment that I can think of. Yep. Uh, that you get uh, motivated um, younger and older people, for that matter, that are seeking um, an internship or you know, a few weeks' work or a month's work or some project work and you, you have the opportunity to meet and greet and engage them and get them involved and uh, most of them, uh, I've been very very lucky, have, have been super performers and most of my team are actually former um, in- interns or, or, or graduate recruits. Oh, there you go. It's probably a good safe testing ground for you too if you're taking on somebody for oh, a month or a fortnight. Absolutely. Or... absolutely. Absolutely, and look, just on that point, I, uh, as much as the PR skills are fundamental, it's um, I, I like to uh, look at people who have different training. So you know, we've got a, a masters of international business here. Um, yeah, sure, a couple of the traditional PR graduate yeah, diploma and and the bachelor course, um, but you know, I, I think lawyers, uh, uh, people with economics degrees. You know, people with different interests are, are, are all very relevant in the PR industry these days. So, do those people um, do those people do a base degree in X or Y politics, economics, whatever, and then and then go on to study PR? Is that um, how it works? No, not necessarily. Not, not necessarily. Um, I, if, if you're talking about a typical, uh, well, you know how what typical PR graduates do, but typically the base arts with a, with a couple of majors thrown in. Um, yeah. Um, but it, it, look, the fundamental skill in, in this industry, there are two actually, being able to listen uh, and secondly, being able to communicate both verbally and in written form. Yep. So I don't just see that being a, a, a restricted domain of arts graduates. Yeah, fair enough. Yep. I was going to ask you also, what have been your greatest professional accomplishments? That's an interesting question. Look, a, a couple that I'm very proud of is that... Um, uh, you know, I've worked with my existing team. Um, I've worked with one gentleman who actually started the same day I did at IPR in 1986. Yeah. Um, uh, Brian O'Neill, a director at PRX, worked with me at Weber Shamwick. He was actually an intern at Weber Shamwick. Okay. Uh, and we've been working together for nearly 25 years. Um, the longevity of the team here is, is really important to me. And um, if you've got, you know, elite performers, you reward them and look after them and um, they reward you doubly back. So that, that's, that's been important. So I'm very proud of that. And equally, the, the client base we, we have and, and uh, continue to um, be engaged with is, is, is something I'm proud of because, you know, a lot of them are very discreet. Um, we don't talk about our engagement publicly, but they're very loyal. Uh, is there anything professionally that you still would like to achieve? Oh, yeah, look, I haven't reached Nirvana by any means, uh, nor is this firm. So, look, there are lots of challenges ahead, uh, and um, I see them, that as being a really 
constructive source of energy, if you like, because I, I just want PRX to continue to do what it's doing really well and grow and prosper. Yep. Um, and and, uh, and that means needing to adapt to, as we talked earlier, about digital technologies and new trends and, and other things. So uh, I'm up to the challenge and looking forward to it. That probably ties in well with one of the other questions I had, which was about professional development. Do you, do you engage in, in any um, formal sort of professional development? How do you sort of stay abreast of all the changes, particularly I'm thinking in the online space and I guess the digital yeah. world? Um, look, I, 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 uh, talking for the team, look, I'll continually ask them, do they need or want to do any further study? Yep. And if they do, I'll support them with that. Um, uh you know, it's uh, you can't sit still in this industry. Uh, can't in any uh, for that matter. Um, but look, from my own personal sense, I've, I've taken it upon myself to um, continually, um, I hope, keep abreast. Uh, so, you know, I've done the Australian Institute of Company Directors course, which I thought was valuable. Yeah. Um, uh, I've sought engagement in in um, uh, the pro bono and not for profit areas. You know, I was on the uh, vice president of the library board. Um, and a director there for nine years, and um, and had a long um, uh, an established role at the library and the foundation. So uh, it, it's um, as much as there's classical ongoing training, there's also um, uh, activity where you keep your networks yeah. open and you engage and um, professionally and uh, change yourself. And, so, and yeah. I feel that being valuable too. Yep. Yeah, so that sort of collegiality keeps you in touch with yeah. what's happening. Yeah, that yeah makes sense. absolutely. I mean, it's um, uh, and and look, I've made a habit of um, uh, also informally um, uh, attaching myself to people who are much older than me because I'm, you know, I, I find that I can learn a lot more from seasoned, wiser, older people, men and women, who uh, can reflect on their past and and sort of uh, uh, give you the benefit of their wisdom and knowledge. That's interesting because it, it feels like the reverse is, is true, that everybody's searching for the, the youngest, latest, hottest thing, but that you're yeah. saying there's actually wisdom in that older generation. and Oh, massive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I think it's a, a great asset and uh, uh, it, it's, it's something that I'm very happy to be able to uh, capitalise on because I, I know taking a point for, for tendency is to be to look to the younger, the younger crew, but that's not what I've found. I'm assuming that your father was a fairly significant influence and inspiration. I'm wondering if yeah. you can talk a little bit about perhaps your father or other people who have influenced you professionally and explain what, what sort of things they've taught you. Uh, well, I, I touched on John Fitzgerald earlier. Uh, uh, he um, uh, he was just a, a brilliant man, a brilliant com communicator, and I feel very fortunate to have been able to uh, <laughs> work under him. Uh, yeah. Look, IPR in the olden days was dotted with legends like um, Greg Brook, who who really led consumer marketing in this country for the Mars Group. Oh yeah. Um, um, and look, I can't look past my my own immediate family. Um, uh, I'm from a large family, but you know, my brothers Paul and Mark were really key drivers of um, particularly corporate and investor relations type PR, government relations, that sort of stuff. Um, my sister Judy, uh, at her peak, ran the Australian May campaign for the Hawke government, which um, was a you know a ten year journey. So you know I learned a lot from my family and, and the values that that brought brought to me and what I did. Um, you don't have children uh, that are going to follow in your footsteps by any chance? Oh look, I'm, I'm lucky to have five kids. Um, one particularly is showing an interest, but the others are, are on different paths. But good yep. luck to them. <laughs> yep. In recent years, have there been any public relations campaigns which you've found particularly inspirational or impressive? I'm just always interested to know, if, uh, yeah, if, if there's other work being done in the field that, that you think is exemplary. Um, look, oh, look there, there are numerous examples. Um, but, uh, look, not wanting to pop your question, um, uh, the obvious stuff or the obvious campaigns are the easy ones in my view. Mm. And and the uh, you know you, you can if you're experienced in the industry you just open the newspaper and you can see what's emanated, emanated from a communications company or a PR unit or something like right? yep. that's obvious it's, it's the the subtlety around the really challenging tasks and and the finesse that goes with those sorts of assignments that that I really admire um, 
and perhaps not as obvious. So, look, there, there are a whole range of um, uh, national advocacy campaigns that are, that are run um, that are really sophisticated, they're long-term, um, and they are the ones that, that really amaze me because, you know, they're not small budgets either. It's not one state or territory. You know, it's it, multiple people in communications units. It's often multiple election cycles. They're the ones that, I, that really amaze me. Okay. So no specific example comes to mind? Uh, no, no. Oh, that's okay. Not, not particularly. Oh, look, at, yeah, there are. And some of them are a soft touch, like the work that, um, say, community groups like the Fred Hollows Foundation do. Uh, okay. they, they turn very serious health issues into a consumer advocacy programs that become, you know, significant fundraisers. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, the same applies to what the... The Danaher family have done with um, MND. Um, what do you think are the hallmarks of an exceptional communications professional? Uh, as I said, the, the fundamental skill is, is to listen, yep. firstly and foremost, uh, because if you can't listen, you can't um, uh, understand the brief, you can't empathise with your client, uh, you can't read stakeholder engagement. That, that's the fundamental skill. Um, and they've got to be proficient in both written and verbal communications. What sort of things, this is probably a bit of an overlap, this question, but what sort of things can a graduate do to distinguish him or herself in such a competitive field? Uh, okay. Um, look, uh, we, we would probably get, I don't know, 50 resumes a year. Uh, and increasingly, particularly with younger people, the graduates, um, they've been to a good school, they've had good work experience, and they've got good marks in one or two degrees, double degrees. Uh, there's not a lot that stands on the path, right? Yeah. Uh, but the the two things that I always encourage younger applicants to consider is uh, their presentation skills. You know, and uh, as a younger man, I did a uh, a presentation course which which took me 13 weeks, three hours a night, but it was fabulous, and and that was all about public speaking and orderly presentation of content and other things. Mm -hmm. but, so presentation is, is, is one key point. And the other one is not, not often thought about, but is the depth and um, diversity of people's references, oh, or okay. referees more so. Yep. Um, so just really make a something jump out on a on a resume, assuming you've seen 50 a year, is, you know, is there someone on their, in their referees that's different or high profile or community-based or... Okay. Just really jumps out at you because otherwise they're all the same. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, very. And there's a, there's a te there's a tendency to get a, a former secondary school teacher to get the lecturer at uni. Um, well, so does everyone else. Yeah. You know, and, and give the give the future employer an opportunity to really understand what 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 you've done or what motivates you by by the quality of your referees. What are the fundamental differences between a PR practitioner of today and one of, say, 10 or 15 years ago? Are they essentially oh, the same it. core skills or is it a different animal? No, I, I think it's fundamentally different. Um, look, I can remember it um, when I started, as I said a couple of times at IPR in 1986, there are 150 people working in the business. Um, so, I, And that was before the fax machines. So that was with a telex machine. And yeah. we had a mailroom with 10 people in it who would hand deliver parcels around the city. Um, you know, there'd be daily media, sometimes daily, multiple daily media drops with media releases to, you know, the CBD media. Um, if you needed to send something interstate or overseas, it'd be by telex. Um, I think in of the 150 people we had, about 50 of those were either secretarial or administration. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at PRX today, I, I've got a, uh, a fabulous and effective um, office manager, uh, but she works three days a week from home. I, I rarely see her, but we speak every day. Um, uh, so, look, technology has really changed every industry and the communications industry is no different. My last last question for you, Stephen, is um, yes. do you feel, um, do you feel that PR is still a, a distinct discipline or have the lines between PR and other fields, such as advertising, blurred really significantly? If you apply what I would call the strategic communications definition of PR, it, it, it's absolutely its own industry. Um, mm -hmm. 
but you know, technically, a lot of people in customer service or in uh, outward-facing roles are, are technically classified as PR people. So there is a blurring. But in the, you know, in what I do, which is strategic communications, it is absolutely still its own industry with a uh, very important current role, and will continue to have a, a fundamental role into how business and industry is done into the future. Okay. To what extent um, are advertising agencies and, and other sort of communications businesses encroaching on the PR space? Oh, they're trying. Um, uh, but look, I, I, I've been part of a global firm and I've seen how they've tried to offer an in integrated service across multiple disciplines and uh, multi, multinational brands tend to like that. Um, a lot of a lot of brands don't. A lot of Australian businesses don't. Yep. So I, I think that the advertising agencies will continue, but I don't know how successful it will be. Um, the, the, new, the newer threat is coming from the consulting businesses like PwC and KPMG and Deloitte, oh. who are they're setting up pseudo comms units. Um, most law firms now have significant comms units. Yep. Okay. Um, so you know that that's where I see the the threat coming is, is from you know existing service providers in the law or you know, you know accounting or consulting moving into trying to move into PR, but whether they're, they're going to have a, a legitimate offer is another thing. Mm, okay, that makes sense to me. All yeah. right, Stephen, I, I think I've probably uh, <laughs> taken up enough of your time, so thank you so much. That's really beneficial to me. All right, beauty, and uh, good luck with it and keep in touch. Thanks for listening to this interview. I hope it provides you with some insight, inspiration and guidance. Thank you.